Hi, my name is Guy Wallace of Epic Incorporated. I'd like to welcome you to this video on driving performance into talent management systems. This is part of my targeting EPI methodology. EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement, is my version of human performance technology or a performance improvement methodology set. EPI has two stages. Stage one, targeting EPI. Stage two are various interventions that could be framed by a DMAIC process or another ADDIE type process to actually create and implement the interventions determined necessary in stage one. Stage two, EPI intervention implementation could include process re-engineering using theory of constraints, Lean, and Six Sigma, plus other methodologies. It could include information technology systems development and implementation. It could include other hardware and tools development and their implementation. It could include instruction and knowledge management systems content development, etc. The purpose of EPI Stage 1 is to deliberately avoid using the methodology set of choice, of practice. If someone's got a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. If you're a Six Sigma practitioner, every problem looks as if it might be solved using a Six Sigma methodology. If you're an instructional designer, the same. Training might be your solution of choice. The PAC processes, my instructional systems design methodology set, is a subset of EPI. In PAC, performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven, training and development of any blend, there are also two stages. Curriculum architecture design, which leads to many modular curriculum development type projects. MCD is my version of the ADDIE methodology that's familiar to most instructional designers. So in a similar fashion, EPI has stage one targeting those efforts leading to the actual development, the new product development end of the methodology set. Let's take a look at the process. This input process output diagram in many different forms is probably familiar to you. When I look at a process flow, I think of processes creating outputs which are inputs downstream, directly to the next process or perhaps to the scrap pile, as always it depends. The measures for both processes and for the processes outputs as inputs are something that's key to understand. Those measures and their standards for either processes or outputs are set by the stakeholders, which includes customers, but customer requirements are sometimes overridden by higher level stakeholders in a hierarchy. This hierarchy, for illustrative purposes only, is an example of that. The customers might ask you to do something that would be in violation of the law, but the governments of the lands that you operate in would supersede those requirements. The same thing if the customer wanted you to sell them your products and services at below your cost, which is not a good strategy for the shareholders and owners. There are enablers that enable the process or processes to meet those stakeholder requirements. But the process itself can be mapped or modeled using various formats. This here presents two complementary views of process performance, a traditional swim lane process map and the performance model view. The performance model is a format that I've been using since 1979. What enables the processes, according to the Ishikawa diagram from the 1980s, would be the men, materials, methods, and machines. 
The Ishikawa diagram, also known as the cause and effect diagram or the fishbone diagram, has evolved over time with different language and a different number of enablers identified for any particular process that's being targeted. Years ago, I adapted the Ishikawa diagram with some of the work from Tom Gilbert, who wrote Human Competence in 1978. I look at enablers in two sets, the human asset requirements and their enablers, and the environmental asset requirements and their enablers. The requirements are driven by the needs of the process. When I look to human and environmental asset management systems, those systems in an enterprise or external to an enterprise that provision the assets that the process requires, I use this model to frame my analysis. Even though organizations won't look like this, they won't be configured like this, this is my diagnostic tool to determine who and where does organizational job, where does organization and job redesign happen? Where does staffing and succession planning happen? recruiting and selection, etc., etc. We are covering these, the human asset management systems, and the requirements imposed on them by the process performance requirements themselves and their enablers. We study the process and their enablers, and we look to the human asset management systems, again, named differently, configured differently, to determine whether or not we are provisioning these adequately to the needs of the process. These in this top tier of my blue boxes, the 13 blue boxes, constitute what I believe are the talent management systems. They bring us the talent, they develop the talent, they reward and recognize the talent, etc., necessary to the needs of the process. We are not covering in this video today the environmental asset management systems, although you should be able to well imagine how this would work to provide the non-human assets to the process. The big picture of EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement, provides a one-page view of all of this and the needs of the process. First of all, this is a scalable view. Just like budgets can happen at a project level, rolling up to a department level, rolling up to a functional level, rolling up to an enterprise budget or set of financials, so too with the data regarding the enablers and regarding the processes themselves. This is one way to architect the processes and architect the enabler systems in place to make sure that they meet the needs of the processes which are in place to meet the needs of the stakeholders. We've already talked a little bit about the process, but the process must be designed to meet all of the stakeholder requirements in some balance if there's conflicts. And there's the two ways to map or model the processes and then you can see the fishbone diagram hanging off to the right of that. But if we look at that more closely, we'll see that the human asset enablers include awareness, knowledge, and skills, physical attributes, psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and values. All of these enablers are dictated by the needs of the process. The same too with environmental asset enablers. The process itself or the processes themselves dictate the needs for data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount, and a culture and consequence system conducive to the needs of the processes. We'll now take a closer look at the human asset enablers and the systems, the talent management systems, that provision to the processes these enablers. 
Again, here's our 13 blue boxes being driven by the process performance and enabler analysis that dictates what are the requirements of the process by our configuration of enablers. And then what are these systems or organizations, internal or external, that provision the right assets to the process. At the top of the list is organization and job redesign systems. Are our talent management systems themselves configuring the jobs conducive to the needs of the process and any variability, predictable or not, regarding the processes? For example, do our organization and job designs accommodate seasonal fluctuations in process demand? Do they account for the enabling knowledge and skills or physical requirements of the performers in the process? Does everybody have to have a strong back or can we configure all the strength requirements, those physical requirements, into one or two jobs versus every job in that organization? The answer is, well, as always, it depends. Do our staffing and succession planning systems bring in the people that we need and gr to grow them to our job set, our performance and role set that we have across our organization or organizations that the enterprise is composed of? Are we adequately, effectively, and efficiently growing our own talent? Do we understand the deltas of the different jobs in terms of the awareness, knowledge, and skills, the physical attributes, the psychological attributes, the intellectual attributes, and the values necessary to the processes that the jobs perform within? Recruiting and selection systems. Are we recruiting and selecting for those enablers that are critical, that are key from job to job. Do we have a handle on that? And is it consistent with our view of our staffing and succession planning systems? Do the training and development systems pick up where the recruiting and selection systems leave off? We have requirements for people with certain enablers in our various jobs. If we didn't recruit and select for those things, does our training accommodate the gaps? Do our performance appraisal and our performance management systems focus in on the needs of the process and the human performers within those processes? Or are we measuring people and managing people against some other set of criteria? Derived from what? Hmm. Do our compensation and benefit systems adequately reward and retain the talent that we require? And do our reward and recognition systems adequately identify and reward and recognize people consistent with their needs, their desires. The same is true for these environmental asset management systems. We can use this kind of diagnostic tool to assess whether or not the systems, the organizations, the processes in place are adequate to the needs of the process, the targeted processes. Are the targeted processes being provisioned with the right human things, assets, or environmental, non-human things, assets? Whatever language you want to use, can you adapt this diagnostic tool to determine the needs of your process and whether they are being adequately met or not? Again, the two types of human asset data includes the performance data and the enabler data. We've talked about the 
process maps and performance model views so that we understand what the process is that must be enabled. And we've looked at the enabler data, awareness, knowledge, and skills, physical, psychological, intellectual attributes, and personal values. Performance competence, in my view, is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And those stakeholder requirements are about the process tasks themselves and the products or outputs of the processes and the tasks. An example of areas of performance, one way to begin to analyze the needs of a job is reflected in this performance model and its areas of performance for the account representative from the ABC company. This is adapted from work that I did back in the 1980s. Territory planning is one chunk of the job. Account planning is a different chunk of the job, but they relate. The customer call planning and preparation, the customer call conduct, the sales follow-up, various reports and administration, and personal development is one way to chunk out the key results areas, the major duties, or what I call the areas of performance for a job. From there we can dive deeper and look at the specifics, the outputs and the tasks, etc. We'll look at an example of that in just a few moments, but let's move on to another set of areas of performance. This one for a store manager of TMC stores, the most convenient stores. It's a made-up example for illustrative purposes only. The store manager's job from this, a real-world project, again back in the 80s, was doing staff recruiting, selection, and training, and also doing work scheduling and progressive discipline of the staff. Store operations was another foci, customer service, inventory management, and finally handling all the payroll, banking, and financial management activities of this job. Another more complete way to look at management areas of performance is using this model, again a diagnostic model. There are various leadership areas of performance and core areas of performance and support areas of performance. These are covered extensively in my 2011 book, Management Areas of Performance Competence. Once we have the areas of performance identified, we can drill down and document the performance, using a performance model in this example, for that area of performance. In this example, quarterly and end of phase project reporting, there are two key outputs, the ABC report and the XYZ report. They have slightly different measures and they have different tasks, and this is all very simplified here to kind of keep it conceptual. So we understand now in this part of the job, in this area of performance, we have two outputs and we have two sets of tasks, one related to each of the outputs. So that's ideal performance. That's what we want people to be able to do. We either select and recruit them to be able to do this in the first place, or we train and develop them to do that, and we measure and appraise their performance against these standards of the job. And we can also begin to look at what are the typical performance gaps or the atypical performance gaps, depending on your need downstream. But in this case, I'm typically looking at what's typical, not once in a blue moon, but what's day in and day out. What are the issues with performance here if I'm trying to solve some problems here? Or if I'm going to train some new hires that are going into this job, can I give them a heads up about what are the typical issues that they're going to be dealing with? What are the causes, how to avoid them, and if unavoidable, what next? So here we can see the two typical performance gaps for the ABC report are that it's late and it's incomplete. Well, we can ask why five times or some other mechanism to determine what are the probable gap causes. Now, the phrase probable is kind of a weasel word 
in that we're not looking at root causes here because of my methodology and how I go about doing this, generating this in a team meeting of a set duration, typically three days, sometimes two, sometimes four. But in three days, we cannot be looking for every root cause here. We want off the top of the master performers who we've brought together and have them articulate, well, why is this happening? Why are the non-master performers struggling in this area? And what I found over 30 years of doing this is that they know why everybody else is struggling on this and they can say, well, the output is late because the input is late or the required data is unavailable or they were just too busy to get it done. And then we can attribute those probable gap causes to different categories. The categories I use are there's a deficiency in the environment or environmental supports. And that's what was at the root of this potentially. Um, that it's a deficiency of the knowledge and skills of the performer that we're looking at, not their boss or somebody else. And it could be that there are other individual attributes and values that are in deficiency here, and that's part of the reason for the lack of ideal performance with those who are not master performers. Now, not every set of outputs and tasks has typical performance gaps and causes, etc. Sometimes it's a requirement of the job and everybody seems to be doing fine. It's nothing to really focus on. So you have to be careful about how you use that. You're not striving to find a performance gap and a cause for every output and task set. That's not uh, appropriate. Typically. Sometimes it might be. As always, it depends. The human enablers of awareness, knowledge, and skills, and physical attributes, psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and personal values, then, can be systematically derived when looking at the performance model data. Process maps may or may not go into enough detail to help a group systematically derive these enablers. As always, it depends. But So that's why I use the performance model with a fair level of data detail in it, not the most micro detail, it's oftentimes macro, but it's to stimulate the thinking of the assembled master performers, whom you might call exemplary performers or accomplished performance. Again, may, many different names for the same thing. But I use master performers and I bring them together to model the performance requirements and identify the gaps for those who aren't master performers. And then I use them to systematically derive these enablers or a subset of these enablers, depending on what my downstream needs are. For an example of my knowledge and skill categories for the awareness, knowledge, and skills, I used these 17 categories to assist me and the group in systematically deriving what you gotta know. And to what level? Do I just have to be generally aware of something and that would be sufficient because of my other prior knowledge? Or do I need new deep knowledge on something? Or do I need an actual skill, a cognitive skill or a physical skill, whichever? When I begin to list out, using my systematic deriving methodology, I might identify that EEO is a knowledge and skill item under the category of company policies and procedures. And you can see by the X on the chart that I only need EEO in one part of my job, in the A part of my job, the staff recruiting, selection, and training part of my job, but I don't need to know about EEO in any other part of my job. Same thing with affirmative action. However, when we get the vacation and day off policy, I use that in four of the seven chunks of my job. And we can begin to look at that performance model data and use that to systematically derive using company policies and procedures when the group begins to answer what company policies and procedures do you need to be compliant in when you're doing part A of the job, when you're doing part B of the job, C, D, E, F, G. And that's why it looks a bit like a scatter diagram in those columns A through G with the X's in there. You should see that pattern. If you don't see that general pattern, some of you know what I'm talking about now with the scatter diagram. If you don't see that pattern from top left swooping down to the bottom right, it's a pretty 
well-guaranteed fact that the facilitator lost control and didn't systematically derive this list of enablers. It may have been a shotgun approach where everybody was calling out everything all over the sun, and therefore you don't really know whether you've captured it as completely as you might have had you been using a more systematic process. And any process needs those human assets the knowledge and skills, the various attributes and values, as well as the environmental assets to enable that process. In 2003, for the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, I did an analysis of production supervisors and zone managers. In that effort, there were 71 outputs and task clusters you know, a cluster of tasks around every output with the measures, there were 71 of those that were identified. The enablers, in terms of knowledge and skills, due to the nature of this project and what it needed, it didn't need the other attributes and values, but we looked at the knowledge and skills and there were 169 discrete knowledge and skills that enabled the performance of those 71 different sets of tasks to produce those identified outputs to the standards of the stakeholders. Earlier in a 2001 project for 35 different call center managers across seven different regions at Verizon, there were 34 outputs identified, each with a cluster of tasks, so an output task cluster of data, and enabling those 34 outputs were 416 discrete knowledge and skill and attribute value items. That's the data regarding the enablers required by the processes. These are the systems or a tool to be used for diagnostic purposes of the systems that might be in place that provide the people and the non-people things to the process. So the talent management systems should involve how we organize the jobs and design the organization itself that's conducive to the processes it supports. The same with our staffing and succession planning systems, part of the talent management suite, if you will, these top seven blue boxes. Recruiting and selection, training and development, or learning and development. Performance appraisal and management systems, compensation and benefit systems, and the reward and recognition systems. Whatever you call your talent management systems or suite of systems, they involve these kinds of things. These kinds of systems and processes that themselves help provision the right humans to the process. The right humans with the right stuff, the right enablers the right awareness, knowledge, and skills, physical, psychological, and intellectual attributes, and the personal values required by the processes. The first thing to do is assess the target processes and then potentially assess what the human enablers and the environmental enablers that are necessary to enable the processes. The second thing to do is then to look at the longer blue column of 13 different boxes or the first seven depending on your scope to assess how well are they provisioning the right stuff to the needs of the process. Avoid nailing every problem or opportunity with your hammer of choice. The solution isn't always training and development, or information technology, or organization and job redesign, or process redesign. I have a six pack of books that were updates of books from 1999 and 2001 and earlier um, that address these things. In particular, the analysis of performance competence requirements helps one dig into understanding what are the processes themselves that people perform within, what are the enablers that 
the people need to bring, what are the non-people enablers for those processes. Another book in the six pack is the management areas of performance competence. If one is looking at managerial performance, then this book helps focus in on that and helps you systematically derive what are the enablers that the processes require. And the final book from Training to Performance Improvement Consulting helps training and learning organizations segue to performance-based training if they're not already there and then on to performance improvement consulting. And performance improvement is what the client wants in the first place. Even if the name of your organization is training or learning, the client really wants performance.